where are we at with Hydra? And once this thing is fully implemented and at scale, like what, what, what can Cardano do that no one else will be able to do? It's an exponential technology. So it doesn't matter if you have a million users or 50 users. If I have 30,000 people, that's a million transactions per second that's occurring, right? right. Is in October, we're, we're actually gonna up the ante a little bit. Very few cryptocurrencies kind of think uh, with this level of parallelization and, and uh, nuance. And that's the magic of Cardano. We design things upfront the right way. Extended UTXO, liquid non-custodial staking. Yeah. These are the kinds of things that they pay huge dividends downstream. You don't see the value initially, but then when we call that a, a turbo unicorn and in the cryptocurrency space, they say it's a coast chain, it's failed and it's a clone of Ethereum. And apparently I'm a cult leader. <laughs> My advice to Forbes is that they should ask for their money back. How is a B team and a C team going to inspire and deal with some of the most complicated challenges a president's ever faced. You're talking not just about blockchain in 2024, you're talking about the rise of AI, the yeah. rise of quantum computing, the rise of synthetic biology. We just dealt with that with COVID. Now imagine super COVID. I am joined today with the founder of Cardano, Charles Hoskinson at Rare Evo in the home of Sin City Crypto, Las Vegas, Nevada. Talk about some of the exciting things that have been happening and announced here at Rare Evo. Charles, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I see you walking to the convention and trying to be pulled in different ways. I really appreciate you taking the time and sitting down with us. Um, I, I want to start and ask you, you were at that VIP Omnia party mm -hmm. and Elijah Wood was DJing. What would you rate as DJing skills one to 10? Well, I'm friends with Elijah, so I obviously have to say 10 out of 10, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, Elijah, he, he is him and Zach, uh, they've been they've been together for a while uh, on the DJ side. I think about over 10 years they've been doing this off and on. Uh, and the last time he DJed for us actually was the consensus after party in uh, 2022. Mm. So it's a pretty easy call to make. You call and say, hey, you want to come and hang out with us at Caesars and do a gig? Oh, yeah, that sounds fun. You know, it's would you ever DJ? Uh, you know, I almost did. Uh, my, my only introduction to it was with Paul Oakenfold when we were at the Cardano Summit in 2021. And he had me come up on stage and uh, I played around a little bit, but it is not my area of expertise. I play the piano. That's pretty much it. Um, and uh, I have a slightly different taste in music. Uh, but it's always it's always good fun to be in these types of places because the energy is so good, especially in Las Vegas, right? Yes, sir. Um, you know, you so five a.m. to twelve a.m. That was your schedule yesterday. You still did a five minute video, and you talked about the the uh, find the bug and keep it right. A million dollars, the lace paper wallet. Some of the things that I took from it that you said. So it's going to be multi asset. It's the most secure paper wallet ever made. It's got PGP keys, which I thought that was going to be some crazy thing, and but it sounds for pretty good privacy, which sounds pretty simple, right? Yeah. Um, and then you talked about having a digital copy as a PDF file, which you know when we talk about having your private keys, we say or your your seed phrase, never store it online, never have yeah. it, you know, always have it written down. What what is that going to look like? And you can maybe go in a little more yeah. depth as far yeah. as that paper wallet. So, so a paper wallet is just basically a piece of paper that you print something that allows you to recover the key words or something to allow you to recover your wallet. So traditionally you have 12 or 24 keywords and it's a seed phrase that when you enter in, you can recover a wallet. So historically how people have done this is they'll get a ledger device or something and then the ledger has the keywords, they write on a piece of paper, those 24 keywords, and they just put it in their safe or something like that. Now you can sometimes type it and then you print it out. And in both cases, it's not secure because if anybody recovers the piece of paper, it's unencrypted. They can just see it and they can fuck with it. So uh, what always bothered me is that there's a very simple, easy way to kind of make this significantly more secure, but you just have to move to kind of two pieces of technology and then everything is streamlined. So first you have to move to QR codes. So instead of mm -hmm. writing things down, you have two QR codes, a public QR code and a private QR code. And the public one gives you the ability to see the state of the wallet. The private one gives you the keywords to actually recover the wallet because there's enough data that you can store on a QR code to store those 24 keywords. Well, a QR code by itself would be unencrypted. So you need some way of securing that. And you can either have a password to encrypt it with something like AES, or you can have a PGP key. Why I like PGP is there's already 30 years of privacy infrastructure uh, around this because it came out in 1991 and there's devices like YubiKeys and all these other things that you can use, smart cards. And uh, people who understand that understand it well. And it's super trivial just to plug something in, push a button, and then encrypt and decrypt. So the workflow is you generate your wallet and instead of saying, hey, do you want your keywords to back it up? It just generates a paper wallet as your backup. And if you've uploaded a PGP key, then suddenly you now have an encrypted artifact. So then 
it, you just print out a piece of paper and that piece of paper basically has these two QR codes on it. You put it in your safe, you print it out, somebody finds it, they can't do anything with it. Mm. But you can easily recover your wallet. Now, the level of security of that is so high that I feel comfortable saying, hey, you also can digitally back this up. So you can put it in your email and these types of things because it's the same as encrypted email. And if the government trusts this for SSL certificates to move classified information and militaries trust this and so forth, it's, it's, it's enough for the vast majority of crypto use cases. Then what's nice is you can expand and widen the aperture and keep adding additional layers of security and capability. So the very next iteration of it is going to be adding DIDs and when you have DIDs, then you can add arbitrary uh, public key systems. So you can add quantum resistant ones or layered ones where you encrypt with multiple keys. So you don't actually have uh, to rely on uh, PGP if you're not comfortable with that for whatever reason. And it's just got a really streamlined, easy user experience. The other thing is to recover wallets instead of typing 24 keywords, you just scan the QR code. Yeah, and you so plug your thing in, you push yeah. a button, and then it's decrypted. Your wallet's fully recovered. It's amazing. So you, know, you think about a cell phone or something like this. Let's say you have your PGP key on a YubiKey. You just scan it with your camera on your cell phone. You plug your YubiKey in, you tap it, and your wallet's recovered. You know, see, so it's super easy. It's super slick. It's super secure. And Lace is going multi-asset, so it's not just Cardano native assets and uh, ADA, but eventually support Ethereum and Bitcoin and other uh, standards. So the paper wallet generator is a universal concern. So we imagine actually we'll probably have more customers making paper wallets in the Bitcoin and Ethereum space than they mm. actually do in the Cardano space. And we can become the preferred infrastructure for that. And that's interesting. That's pretty cool if you think about it. That is pretty cool. You know, one, one of the things for me is, you know, I, I'm all about, hey, we're talking about onboarding. You know, everyone says onboarding the next billion users. Well, there's so many pain points to where, you know, if I want to set up a wallet for my mom, I hear mom, write these words down, but don't take a picture. Don't put it anywhere. You got to store it here. Have multiple copies, maybe write half down, give it to this person. And so I think having the ability to store it somewhere online where it's easily accessible, but it's also encrypted and safe, I think is super important. And I hope it doesn't fly above people's heads how, how significant uh, that really is in bringing on the next uh, billion users. You know, you uh, I saw a video of you having a, a, a lot of fun on the Hydra Doom. So you picked up a chainsaw and you're um, where are we at with Hydra? And I saw right. Global TPS got to four thousand yeah. transactions per second. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Adam Dean, which uh, amazing developer in the Cardano community, he said, look, these are actual transactions that are that that go through Plutus that are on the blockchain, not not some BS transactions. You know, uh, we talk about people hyperinflating their transactions per second number. I'm not going to name any names. Um, but where are we at with Hydra? And once this thing is fully implemented and at scale, like what 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 can Cardano do that no one else will be able to do? So when we thought about how to build a system that preserves the original intent of blockchain technology, so Satoshi's vision. Uh, and we thought about how do you achieve scalability for this? You know, there's there are things that come up like blockchain trilemma, for example, this this relationship between opposites that if you embrace one, you diminish the others. W what we decided to do was kind of an all of the above scalability strategy. So we looked for protocols that allowed you to, without having to shard, massively scale up the layer one throughput, so that's Ouroboros Leos, things that allow you to take bundles of things together and do those bundles in a compressed representation. So a great example would be rollups. We see that, or state channels. That's what Hydra does. And then also to recognize that certain incredibly demanding applications should probably be run as a side chain as opposed to a DAP. And World Mobile is a great example of that uh, and uh, in other pieces of, of infrastructure that are very unique in their, in their semantics. So Hydra is, is the crown jewel of this because Hydra doesn't have a token. Hydra is something that you would take and integrate into your DAP, and it gives fast finality and potentially unbounded throughput. Because as you gain users, you just spin up more heads mm. and it load balances it. And the actual activity on blockchain on the Cardano network is quite small. So it, there's, it's, it's, it's an exponential technology. So it doesn't matter if you have a million users or 50 users, you have relatively the same type of setup for mm. something like that. So a video game is super awesome to showcase that potential because when you think about a video game, what you're doing is every frame is a transaction. Yes. So 35 frames per second from the case of the Hydra Doom demo. And, and there you say, okay, well, if I have multiplayer, if I have 30,000 people, that's a million transactions per second that's occurring, right? Right. You know, and so we said, well, if we do this demo, 
people know it works right because they can see the transactions and also they can play the game if there's latency and the it's shitty game experience obviously the channel's not working if it's a great game experience then hydra's working at scale and so the next step after this this proof of concept demo that we did here at rare evo is in october we're, we're actually going to up the ante a little bit add in mm. a lot more multiplayer capabilities and then have a deathmatch mode where people can fight each other Wait, what? and have on chain a smart contract on mainnet because this will run on mainnet uh, and put $100,000 of USDM in the contract. And whoever wins the death match actually gets the money. So, so this is the power of Hydra where we're now that we have incremental commit and decommit and all these other things, it's becoming very real and very applicable for developers. And we're kind of building a corpus out that allows developers to use that in their DEXs and their voting apps and all the other things that they really care about. And this kind of showcases the uh, the scalability and power of it. And it's important to understand it's just one of four scalability mechanisms that we have that we're pursuing in parallel as an ecosystem. Very few cryptocurrencies kind of think uh, with this level of parallelization and, and uh, nuance. And that's the magic of Cardano. We design things upfront the right way. Extended UTXO, liquid non-custodial staking. Yeah. These are the kinds of things that they pay huge dividends downstream. You don't see the value initially, but then when I'm sitting here and using a chainsaw and doom, you know, and <laughs> killing things and it's all on, uh, it's all on chain, that's a pretty magical thing, especially given it doesn't create any bloat for the Cardano ecosystem. It is. And, you know, I saw, and I, and I know you saw too, that I think it was a Forbes article where they, they pretty much car called Cardano a clone of Ethereum. I'm sitting there, I'm thinking like, Ethereum, I would I would argue, is more of a clone of Cardano, right? Going into staking, right? You have the liquid staking fully on chain, right? Uh, and so it's just interesting. I think a lot of people are so worried. And you talk about this on your on your channel all the time. Is they're so worried about number go up and the price. If you actually look at what are they building, and it and it really takes someone who is truly invested in the space to be able to forecast five, 10, 20 years down the road and understand that. It's going to take time. It's going to take resources to build these out the right way, and we'll know we'll we'll we'll, we'll see mm -hmm. the reward thereafter. And I don't think a lot of a lot of chains or companies in our space are even willing to go through that process, right? Well, I mean, the problem with crypto is it gets ahead of itself and it creates blatantly unrealistic expectations that so true. are senseless. You know, in normal Silicon Valley stuff, if you go from an idea to an enterprise that's twelve billion dollars in value with millions of customers. Yeah in less than 10 years, we call that a, a turbo unicorn and people get very excited about it. And they That's say, 10 years. <laughs> yeah. They say you're an amazing entrepreneur. In the cryptocurrency space, they say it's a coast chain, it's failed and it's a clone of Ethereum and apparently I'm a cult leader. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bizarre space to be in. You know, I look at things in terms of decades um, because that's how change is done when you talk about changing economic, political and social systems. You're not just talking about changing it for a 20 year old kid who likes TikTok. You're talking about changing it for 80 year old grandma. You're talking about changing it for institutions that may be centuries old. Yeah. You know, at some point the Vatican will probably do a CBDC. It's right. a 2000 year old institution, okay? It goes back to the Romans. So a uh, world changes at a different clock and cryptocurrencies blockchain where they get interesting is not making things better, faster, cheaper. We already see that with open banking and other protocols. The it's, it, cryptocurrencies, the point of them is to change the game itself. Yeah. And so we have, in Cardano land, we've always had that reverence for the significance of what we do, which is why we, from the very beginning, embraced peer-reviewed research, from the very beginning, embraced formal methods. It's why we think in a very considered and deliberate way. I mean, if you look at the governance system of Cardano, just about to turn on here in two weeks or yeah. three weeks. And that is the product of over two years of conversations. And uh, people from more than 25 countries participate in those conversations. So most people don't see that iceberg of work. They just see the little cap of it. It is blatantly offensive when Stephen Ehrlich says things like we're an Ethereum clone, especially when he's the director of research at Forbes. <laughs> My advice to Forbes is that they should ask for their money back. Um, and probably find a different director of crypto research, especially since he came from Kraken. He should know better. But again, right, that's yeah. just just how the just how the media works in our industry. It, the incentives are wrong. The incentives are aligned with VC back coins. The incentives are aligned for the flavor of the week. There's a hedonic amnesia where they tend to forget the wins and they just focus on the losses and they focus on the next big thing. And ultimately, it's counterproductive because it lulls people into this belief that if it's not instantly good, therefore bad. And, uh, you know, what's the next big thing? Hydra is a great example of that, where we told everybody what we were going to do and we did it. 
Now we're starting to see the fruits of the labors. But for years, people said, oh, hydro, hydro was vaporware and it didn't work. And yeah. we said, well, no, it works. It just takes years to build this type of thing. And you have to build an ecosystem around it. And after it's there, they'll find another thing to, to go and complain about. I liken it to like VoIP. If you remember VoIP, you know, voice over internet you know, protocol. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When we were waking, you know, when we were kids, we we go and see like movies and people have video calls and we say, "Wow, that's the future. That's so cool." Right. I I try really hard, but I can't remember the first video call that I've made. Do you remember the first video call you made? No. It's just a fact of life. It now. was probably to my dad trying to teach him how to use it. Exactly. You know, <laughs> uh, so so that's the thing. It's like it was so revolutionary, and magical at the time, and so incredible at the time. But now you can't even remember the first one you made, and it's so uh, so commonplace. I just had an interview with Robert Kennedy earlier today, and he dialed in on Zoom, and you know everything was there. So so it's just it's just a part of the commons, and uh, and we tend to misremember how significant that was. And the cryptocurrency space is much the same way. You know, we do these incredible things, and then we just take them for granted, and then we say, okay, what you got for me tomorrow? Right. And I also think it comes down to laziness as well, right? It's it's so easy to look at a chart and say, oh, the, this one went up 300%, it's, it's, this it's one. Not, it's not lazy. It's, it's, it's what we call rational ignorance. You know, rational ignorance is a, is a game theoretic phenomena. And what it translates to is the value of becoming informed is less than the information itself. So for example, uh, you could become an expert on American healthcare and you could spend an enormous amount of time and read all these books and have a strong opinion about Medicare and Medicaid and all this other stuff. Great. Well, if at the end of the day, you have the same vote as the crazy homeless guy who thinks the alien stole his penis, um, <laughs> you know, what does that tell you? It tells you that, well, why did you spend all that time if, if you got the same outcome? So the rational action is to stay ignorant. To really understand cryptocurrencies, you have to dig. You have to dig so hard. You know, you have to understand cryptography, distributed systems, mechanism design. You have to understand how to run an OSPO. You have to understand governance. You have to understand all these incredibly mercurial and deep things. We've written 211 academic papers and we're not there yet. And we brought 168 scientists together from institutions from Stanford to Tokyo Tech and everywhere in, in between. And there's still work to do. So what the fuck chance does a regular everyday person have to go into that ocean that's so right. incredibly deep? So what you look for is what we call bike shedding. You look for vanity metrics. In bike shedding, the, the story comes from that people were talking about how to build a nuclear reactor. They spent about 10 minutes discussing how to build it. And then they spent hours arguing over the bike shed in front of the <laughs> nuclear reactor where people would store their bikes. Why? Because how many people really understand how nuclear reactors that work? That is a good point. How many people understand how a bike shed works? That is very true. If you're familiar with it, you can talk <clears throat> about it. So price is the MacGuffin. Yeah. It's really easy to do that comparison. Say, well, Solana's here and Ethereum's here and Cardano's here. Therefore, they, this guy's a winner and this guy's a lunar, loser. And, and you can't get much deeper because there's a Dunning-Kruger. You don't have the ability to get any deeper with the stuff. And there's no incentive for you to actually spend the time to learn. That, that's a very good point. You know, you mentioned 211 academic papers. Just, just so people understand, how long typically does it take to, 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 to do one of those, an academic paper? Depends on the nature of the paper. Some could be a month and some could be three years. The case of Ouroboros Leos, where wow. we were really trying to grapple with the blockchain trilemma, you know, where we're trying to balance scalability, security, and decentralization, uh, what we achieved there was monumental. We actually create, achieved what's called a one minus delta protocol. So it basically means it's the best possible result you can get for a distributed system that's uncharted. Um, that took three years of deep, deep, deep research. And it leverages a lot of unique things like proof of equivocation and, uh, and uh, Mithril is the instrument for that. It leverages the extended UTXO model we have. So it's very unique to Cardano's technology. And it was a very mercurial paper. And it was deeply frustrating to write because uh, it was it was delicate. You know, it's like you're trying to balance all these spinning plates and you're trying really hard to keep them all in the air in the same velocity. Other papers are, are quite straightforward and, and they're very simple to do. And they're not academically interesting, but they're like the broccoli. You need to, mm -hmm. you need to pick a winner and make a decision on how to do <clears> something. And we've done that before. But regardless of take three years or one month, if the intention is to publish, you go through the same process. And that process is peer review. And it's not a buzzword, it means something. Right. And, and I understand in the social sciences with gender studies and people dressing up as horses and shit, maybe it's weird. It's and unicorns now. Unicorns, okay, <laughs> that's fine. Um, that's their thing. In the STEM field, it's still rigorous right. and it's not political, okay? Uh, when you apply, when you submit a, a paper to a cryptography conference, and by the way, peer review in computer science is done through conferences 
predominantly, not uh, journals for those listening. Um, when you when you submit to a, a rigorous conference like Crypto or Eurocrypt, you only have about a 10% chance of having that paper actually get accepted. Oh, wow. Nine out of 10 were rejected. Okay, so, so you can put all that time yeah. in and... Exactly. Just, wow. You have to go and revise it. And the referee process is brutal. You're dealing with people who not only have PhDs in the topics, are professors, and they've been doing it for decades. And cryptographers really love fucking people's stuff up. It's their favorite <laughs> thing in the world. The worst thing you can do is say something's secure. The worst thing you can do is say something's right. They, they're they the ultimate rules lawyer, like in the Dungeons and Dragons game. Well, actually, they're that <laughs> well, you guy. See, uh... You see, they're that guy. And But imagine that guy with a PhD and 20 years of experience in doing that. So they sit there and they really try to break your stuff and they they get like a sick, weird fetish of, of doing that. And you have a dozen or so of them looking at your stuff and doing that. And then you have to go and after they accept it, talk to them and have them yell at you some more and criticize you in their own papers. So it really is a great crucible of truth. And the reason why it's so rigorous in cryptography is nation states use it. Yeah. You know, they use it for secure communication, the NSA and military applications and these types of things. So from a national security perspective, if if we don't have those rules, lawyers, China's reading your email, mm. Russia's reading your email. So that system is brutal. And we, we realized that it was a very high watermark, a very high bar to do it. And it took us years to hire the people and figure out how to navigate it. But now it's just, uh, it's like breathing air for us or drinking water. It's, it's, it's an easy thing for us to do because we have all those people there. And now we have a reliable cadence of papers. The other beautiful part of peer review is it's a centralized brain. One of the biggest problems in the cryptocurrency industry is the founder effect. Mm. You know, so we, oh, Vitalik is going to solve all these things or Anatoly is going to solve all these things. And even if they are very smart and talented and capable, what happens when they get old or tired or compromised and they just don't want to do it anymore? Then who's the next brilliant guy to come in and keep that driving your innovation, very right? Good point. Yeah. And when you have <clears throat> academia, academia, you have 168 scientists, you know their names. Do you care about their names? There are dozens so institutions. You don't care because it's a decentralized brain and new people come in all the time. So you're not only do you get a good cadence of innovation that has strong checks and balances, but you have new faces all the time to continue the innovation engine. And if you lose your founder, you don't suddenly worry, God, how do we solve this problem? And that's why it was so important for us to embrace it. I thought that was obvious. But for our industry, it's one of those things where... Now we're just they, a they bunch do, of degenerates. Yeah, they trust. just mock it. And I'm <laughs> like, guys, don't you care about decentralization? This is one of the single most important things uh, for decentralization is the concept of a decentralized brain. You know, uh, some people might not value it now, but uh, more than likely, well, probably they will. They'll kind of be, they'll be at a point where they'll be forced to, right? And then here is a, here's a beautiful project like Cardano has already done the, the work. Um, you know, we talk about papers and publications. Um, my uh, co-host had a bright idea of doing a crypto almanac. Um, where we, uh, you know, they forecast like farm stuff. Yeah. I, I didn't even know what an almanac was. Uh, <laughs> so he wants to do a crypto almanac. I'm curious, will you be, uh, are you willing to, uh, to pre-order some or commit to pre-ordering some of our uh, crypto almanacs that come out in October? We promise to be fair to Cardano. Right, okay. Right, right. Well, what I could do is like shave my head and go to the airports and, you know, go Hare Krishna and start handing them out and invite people to the vegetarian feast. You know you're a man of the people, Charles. I'm a man of the people. I I really care about this. (laughs) It'll just be like uh, the last airbender. Uh, Just hopefully the good one. The good, yeah, the good one. Um, I see you, you brought in a, you know, you mentioned RFK in your chat today. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. Uh, We've seen a lot of the big Bitcoin and crypto proponents, the Winklevoss twins and and everyone else. I'm not going to start naming people, but they've endorsed Trump. You've endorsed RFK. Uh, a lot of people, and I'm not saying this is what I see, a lot of people say, hey, that's kind of a wasted vote because he's independent and historically I'm not going to get into talking. Right. So so why did you decide to endorse RFK and kind of not do what everyone else was doing, pretty much endorse Donald Trump? So, you know, I, I, I the first election uh, that I was an adult was 2004, it was George Bush and John Kerry. Mm. And I, I was just quite not old enough to vote. So I, the first one I could actually vote in was 2008. Me too. And since uh, since that time, um, every election is, quote, the most important election of our lifetime. And you can't, quote, throw your vote away. Uh, I'm just damn tired of Democrats and Republicans. Um, they, they've given us so much bullshit. I mean, the Democrats don't even believe in democracy anymore. And they're not even pretending to believe in democracy anymore. First, they wouldn't let anybody run against Biden. <laughs> he was basically a demented corpse. <laughs> and then this guy, this guy was obvious to anybody. And by the way, they knew, the media knew, that a Parkinson's expert was visiting the White House every month 
didn't talk about it until they decided to kill him, you know, get get rid of him. So what did they do? They 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 it, as soon as the debate happened, they they went and all the coverage went negative. He was the most brilliant guy, should be put on Mount Rushmore. He's got these incredible faculties, raw command of the facts are incredible. And then the minute they decide that they have to get rid of him, uh, oh, he's he's fading. Uh, he only can work four hours a day. You know, he forgets stuff all the time. Uh, it, it was obvious to anybody with a brain Such that this, this guy was not capable of the rigors of the presidency. It's the hardest job in the world. Then you got Trump. And so I often said it was like dementia versus demented in our, <laughs> our most important election of our lifetime. And you got this guy, he's 77 years old, and he can't keep a coherent thought in his brain. In fact, I'll give you a, I'll give you a story if relevant okay. to the Bitcoin space. So he went to speak at Bitcoin 2024. And Trump comes in. We saw your reaction video, by the way. Gary. Oh, it was, it was, I, had a, I had fun with that, man. The Gary Gensler nipples, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so anyway, this dude comes in and these guys pay to have a round table with them like $895,000 a ticket. Right, yeah. Right, crazy yeah. fucking amount yeah. of money, you know? And they're sitting down, they're supposed to like really inform him on what is going on. And this guy sits down, he's just rambling for 30 minutes about Israel and all this other stuff. And then they get maybe five or 10 minutes of actual policy and it just goes, zhoop over his head, right? Then he goes out and riffs it for 45 minutes. And it's very clear that he's like the kid who didn't do his book report. And he just read like, the cliff notes. He, he, he just went to Wikipedia, like before going into class on a cell phone. And then he's like, all right, here we go. And he's got his, his talking points for five minutes. You cannot elect somebody to office who has that, who's so bereft of depth. And there's this argument, well, you know, he'll pick great people. Well, he had 44 cabinet members when he was president the first time. 40 of them didn't endorse him. Mm. And, and it's always the same thing. Uh, Mad Dog Mattis, he's, he's so brilliant. He's so incredible. And he's the greatest general of his generation. And then after he fires him, he's washed up. He's a has-been, mm. all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> Rex Tillerson, he's a killer. He's so great. And it comes in. It's the same thing again and again and again. The guy is incapable of picking good people around him. Why? Because good people don't want to follow a guy like that. Mm. If you, as a leader, take all the air out of the room, then what you're left with is, is a bunch of oxygen-starved people. Nobody wants to be part of that administration. So you get your B team, you get your C team. How is a B team and a C team going to inspire and deal with some of the most complicated challenges a president's ever faced? Yeah. You're talking not just about blockchain in 2024. Talking about the rise of AI, the yeah. rise of quantum computing, the rise of synthetic biology. We just dealt with that with COVID. Now imagine super COVID. You know, you're talking about wait, super COVID? Like they, they just made in a lab avian flu that has a 90% mortality rate and it is just as infectious as COVID. Okay. So oh, so you great. got a president that's got to deal with that on a global basis. Talk about the rise of nanomaterials like graphene and other things like that could be the greatest environmental toxin in human history. People are scared about microplastics in their dicks. Wait, <laughs> wait till you get graphene in your dick. That's, great. That's some Wolverine Can I write with it? Right is, there, that, is that graphite with a, in the pencils? No, no. That's a super material that you oh. can never get rid of and probably will cause turbo cancer. Holy shit. Um, so, so, so there's so many things the U.S. president is dealing with alongside a $35 trillion debt of which Trump added $8 trillion dollars to has to deal with the cleanup of the disastrous foreign policy of Biden, where we have Ukraine and all this other stuff in Israel and the, the world's on fire, has to deal with all that stuff. It also has to deal with the rise of China and China likely invading Taiwan in 2027. That's what that's the year they're planning to do it. So both sides have not proven that they're capable of doing this. And you know what I'm doing is I'm saying I'm tired of throwing my vote away on the lesser of two evils. I'm going to vote principles. And if the rest of America starts doing this, every election cycle, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 percent will start going to a third party candidate. And what will end up happening is eventually one of them will win. Yes. So maybe it's not Kennedy, but you just saw in the interview I did, you talked to a person that has had a front row seat to the United States for policy at the highest level since 1961. Yeah. His uncle was the president. His father should have been the president, yep. but was killed in 1968, probably by the U.S. government. And, and this guy just has witnessed and watched every dirty trick that's ever been done. And, and he's, uh, he's, he understands how the beast works and he understands why it works the way it does. And you know what? He's an incredibly collaborative, incredibly smart and, and very high integrity person. And what we're basically saying is, despite all those things, because the media has told us, throw your vote away, we're not allowed to vote for him. We now have to vote for the lesser of two evils. Which is bullshit. We can live through Kamala Harris. We can live through Donald Trump. I don't subscribe to this belief of the most important election of our lifetime and America will completely come to an end 
if we're foolish enough to elect the wrong person. It's just a, it's, it's a fallacy, and it's a fallacy told to preserve and protect a bipartisan duopoly whose sole purpose is to maintain and preserve the power of the deep state. And the end result is endless wars we don't win. The end result, $35 trillion in national debt. We're now 60% of every dollar we collect, it goes to the interest rate on the debt. The end result is more than half of America has a mental illness or a chronic ailment. The end result is we eat poison food all the time. The end result is media that's 24 seven propaganda. The end result is that people don't believe in America anymore as yeah. a country. They just don't care about this nation anymore. If you polled kids in the 60s and you said, what do you think about America? He said, we're a great nation and we achieve great things. When Kennedy said, we're going to go to the moon because it's hard, everybody believed him. When you poll kids today, what do you think of America? We're implicitly biased and racist. We're yeah. an evil country. We're going to fail. China's going to destroy us. They're just waiting for the collapse. Yeah kids today. There's no hope whatsoever. So you're going to tell those kids, we're going to solve the problem by taking a guy who was already president and vote for him again because he has a slightly better crypto policy than the other person. And somehow, magically, that's just going to solve everything because, uh, because he just has all the solutions, even though he has none of the people to actually solve it. And who's going to work with him? Let's say you vote for Trump. You really honestly believe the Democrats, after saying he's the orange Hitler, are just going to wake up and be like, for the good of the nation, we're going to yeah. work with this guy. No. I don't think either side would do it. Exactly. It's going to be four years of protests, four years of obfuscation, four years of lawsuits, four years of grandstanding and all this stuff. And the vitriol will just be dramatic. And it's the same if Harris comes in. It'll be four years of stalling. So is that really what we want as a nation? Is another yeah. four years while our debt goes from 35 trillion to 50 trillion, we have four or five more proxy wars that young poor kids have to go and die into and there's no accountability. Do we really want that? Or maybe just maybe we should just do something different for the first time ever. But no, no, you just can't do it. It's too risky. You can't This cycle, we're not allowed to throw our vote away. But I guess 2028, we'll right. be allowed to do that, right? right? No, because it'll be the most important election of our lifetime. We got to do it. It's, it's a lie. You know, and, and it's got to stop. And so I'm just done. I've I've left the reservation. I'm now uh, in in a place where I'm never going to vote for a Republican or a Democrat again. I'll work with them if they're elected, because you know we want good policy, we want great things to happen. But I will absolutely never support one because 100% of our problems were caused by either a Democrat or a Republican. That's a fact. They, they do not <laughs> deserve power at this point. They've after Iraq, after losing Afghanistan, after the COVID policy yeah. and all the horrible things they've done, after the pathological lying, after the spy state that reads all of our emails and all the horrible things that they've done, you know, they can't even, they can't even be honest about Nord Stream. Right. You know, yeah. th they, they say the Russians destroyed their own pipeline. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Let's right. spend billions building it I, and I mean, then break it. That's how stupid they think we are. They're yeah. just, they're just like, it, it, it's, it's so far beyond the pale at this point and it's one giant psyop and and americans are just tired and they're worn out and they deserve better this is the country that invented the internet this is the country that went to the moon we were so innovative in the 20th century yeah. we went from kitty hawk to the moon in 63 years there are people who lived through that right. where they actually witnessed man take flight and witnessed man step on the moon that's how innovative this nation is and now we can't even figure out how to build a website as a fucking country. Amen. You know, and Amen so, and so and we're going to solve that problem by electing a new guy, you know, who's also a Republican, also a Democrat that magically will just solve every problem. No, I'm going to opt out. I'm done. People can make the decisions they make. You, you know, I, I'm not in the mood of asking for permission from the government to do things. We deal with what we deal with. I don't, I'm not naive enough to believe that if Trump gets elected, that magically everything will get better. He can't technically even fire Gary Gensler. His what do you mean? His term ends in 2026. But can't they? Gensler has to resign or be impeached. Oh. That's why Biden hasn't fired Hester Pierce or any of these other people. You can't just go and say resign. So Gary could stay. And that's the thing. They lie to us. They say, oh, I'll fire him day one. It, historically, people have offered resignations, but they don't have to do that. They can just wait it out like a bureaucrat would. And I could see Gary doing that. Interesting. You know, and this is the stuff that comes up, the mismatch between reality and perception, bravado, and the actual mechanism of the government. I don't even think Trump is aware of this because of the way that these guys operate, you see? And so that's why I say, let's stick the facts and let's, let's really acknowledge that the nation is very sick. We're very divided. 
We're at each other's throats. People are starting to hate people they have no reason to hate solely on the basis of politics. Yeah, There's going to be people listening to this who are Democrats who, oh, how dare you? And people listening to this who are MAGA people who say, oh, Charles is terrible and all this stuff. We just got to fall in line. It's like, guys, you're part of the problem. You've been propagandized. You're believing things that aren't true and you're ascribing savior characteristics to people who shouldn't have it. We should be a rules-based society. We should be a society of equality. We should be a society where everybody plays by the same game. And when the system is rigged, we shouldn't indulge, endorse, and, and build up a rigged system. We should tear those systems down and replace them. And if your vote takes us in a direction where we continue the rigging, it's not going to solve anything. Yeah. And you have enough data because both administrations have now been in power for four years. So literally, you've run the experiment for eight years. We we spent just as much money under Trump as we did under Biden-Harris. And did everything magically get better nope. over the last eight years or did it get worse it got over worse. the last eight years? It got worse. Yes. It got worse. You know, I have three kids. And uh, for me personally, I've seen my 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 car pay, my uh, car insurance bill, my grocery bill, especially my grocery bill. And during the summer, all these damn kids want to do is eat. But, you know, and I'll kind of, I'll kind of end it at this. You know, it's very well said is people forget that the government is supposed to work for us, yes. not the other way around. And so if if we continue to let them divide us, continue to let them silence us, then they're going to keep doing what they want to do and uh, we'll never see any uh, thoughtful change. Yeah, and so then you just got to pick a line in the sand and say, moving forward, I'm just not going to consent to this anymore. So voting independent is saying, I no longer consent. And also, by the way, throw your vote away. The vast majority of Americans live in places where their vote does not count. If you live in California, if you're a Republican, your voice does not count. <laughs> So if you live in Massachusetts, if you're a Republican, your voice does not count. If you live in Alabama and you're a Democrat, your voice does not count. If you live in Wyoming and you're a Democrat, your voice does not count. Last cycle, 73% of people in Wyoming voted for Trump. Wow. Okay, so so don't fucking believe that your voice counts. You don't. There's only like six, seven states that are even going to matter in this election. Right. And, and, and if you live in one of those states, maybe that's irrelevant. But if you live in any of the other states, where are you throwing your vote away? It's already been pre-decided between two choices that are really bad. So maybe just maybe if more and more people actually vote third party in those states, it's a polling mechanism to show how much discontent we have in this two-party duopoly. And also a very fundamental question, why the hell don't we have ranked choice voting or preference ordering? You know, so instead mm. of voting for one person, you get to rank people and say, oh. I like candidate one and two and three. So maybe you like Kennedy and then Trump and then Harris or something like that, as opposed to the insane system of either or. Right. Because if you had that, then third parties could actually win. You know, that's and, interesting. And, and so that's the thing. It's just by the ballot architecture alone, we could dramatically improve political diversity inside the nation. So don't get lied to and don't get caught up in this trap. Be a free thinker and, and really stand for something and have integrity. America lives or dies solely by the political investment the citizens have. And the single greatest evil of the bipartisan duopoly has been to convince people that they're helpless and have no say or choice. The Democrats are so drinking the Kool-Aid, they're okay with the fact that they didn't get to pick the nominee. Right. They didn't even <clears throat> pretend that they got to pick the nominee. Literally, the party just picked it. And there is going to be tens of millions of Americans who pull the lever that, that are okay with that. And so are we a democracy when the party picks its candidate? Can anybody reasonably explain the difference between this and the Politburo with the Chinese? Nope. I can't. Nope. Uh, we'll, we'll end it there, Charles. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. We're excited here at our channel to see what Cardano does in the future. And we're excited to uh, maybe come down to the summit and do that uh, that Hydra death match. Do him death $100,000 bounty. Looking at you, Robin. I'd Looking love at to you. see you guys win. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate Cheers. it. Take care.